Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. The belief in a supernatural source of evil is not necessary. Man alone are quite capable of every wickedness. Joseph Conrad The 1960s to the 1990s were a long three decades for Nigeria. The transition from colonialism to independence and the various coup had taken its toll. The country had yet to be stabilized, and amidst it all, we had begun to see various anomalies in rising crime. From the notorious Dr. Ishola Oyunusi of the 1970s, to Brutal Lawrence Anini of the 1980s, to Derrico Uwamama of the 1990s, there were abnormalities acceptable abnormalities by societal standards and basic reasoning. The crimes they committed were crimes propelled by greed, pride, envy and the likes, but nothing would prepare the people of Lagos State for the crimes of Clifford Orji, for his crimes were at a time unheard of, unnatural and downright disturbing. This is the story of Clifford Emmanuel Orji the first known Nigerian cannibal, or as some would like to call it, the story of the first known Nigerian man-eater. I'm Oyeza Malik and this is A Very Nigerian Crime. Oshodi Isolo, a local government area of approximately 45 square kilometers, it was formed by the Second Republic Governor of Lagos State, al Latif Kayode Jakande, also known as Baba Kikiri. Therein lies the popular expressway. It served as a connecting route for Apapa Waf Tinkan and the ever-bustling Muratala Mohammed Airport. It was a lively area with an influx of different folks from various walks of life. It is quite surprising how Clifford was able to get away with so much for so long in such a busy area. I suppose there is wisdom in hiding in plain sight. Clifford Emmanuel Orji was born in the year 1966. He spent his earlier years as a razor blade seller in the Oshodi market before moving on to change trade and became a self-proclaimed native doctor, going by the name Chineyalu. Clifford could be described as a bit queer and a man who seemed quite off, but also someone easily dismissed. Following his change in business, he moved to a self-created shack under the highway bridge on Oshodi Isolo Expressway, where he advertised himself as a native doctor. He was known for looking quite unkept and sometimes parroted the area like a madman. He would occasionally chase random people and he did this during the daytime, giving the impression to the people of insanity, probably to discourage anyone from entering his abode. According to neighbors, he would vacate his residence half-naked in the early hours of the morning and spend the better parts of the day at the bus stop. The nearby inhabitants also noted that he had the habit of roasting meat during the night and some believed there was more to his peculiar love for meat. If only they knew the gruesome story that went on in the grotto. On the 3rd of February of 1999, at the Toyota bus stop in Osho de Isolo at the highway bridge, the startling cry of a woman was heard by a passerby who had stumbled upon Clifford's grotto. It was the early hours of the morning and he was on his way back from church. Her cry had aroused his curiosity and he decided to take a peek into Clifford's shock. He was met with the view of an emancipated and malnourished woman who looked like she had been specially prepared and readied for slaughter. But his shock was far from over. Inside a grotto where human remains and a freshly cooked soup that supposedly contained human flesh. The passerby was expectedly terrified. He ran out yelling and screaming, and this got the attention of people nearby. A crowd was slowly coming together, and Clifford panicked. He ran out of his grotto in a feeble attempt to make a run for it. Clifford was chased by the curious crowd and was eventually caught and beaten before being dragged back to his shack. The scene inside the shack was horrifying. Inside the grotto was a woman named Awao. She had been reported missing and had been held in captivity by Clifford and was to be killed if the passerby hadn't heard her desperate cry for help. 
She had been sexually assaulted by Clifford severally and was physically deteriorating. She was taken to Ikaja General Hospital for treatment. During the course of her treatment, she spoke to no one and was thoroughly wasted. Awao sadly died on Friday, two days after she was saved from Clifford's tyranny. With her official time of death pronounced at 10 a.m. by the managing director of Ikeja General Hospital, Dr. Femi Olubite. The sight of the emancipated Awao rose to crowd's ire, and Clifford was beaten in his shack, pulled down. But their anger wasn't quenched as they went after Clifford's only known friend who lived nearby, and his shack was pulled down as well. Clifford's accomplice, a man named Tahiru, had the four meters pit close to his abode in which the bodies of their victims were being kept after they were killed. So the question is, how could this have been going on in broad daylight and in proximity to this much human activities and go unnoticed? It is alleged that Clifford often walked around naked with his unkept matted hair and the times he did wear clothes, they were very filthy. This could have discouraged anyone from coming in close proximity to him. The next question would be how he lured his victims. As expected, no one in the right senses would want to be associated with the so-called madman. It is reported that he claimed to be a native doctor, and that could have been how he had been luring his victims. Following his apprehension by the crowd, Clifford alongside his accomplice were arrested by the police, and it wasn't long before they began to confess. Clifford claimed to have other accomplices aside Tahiru, and his accomplices could have been as many as ten. Clifford and his accomplice were paraded in the street before the media and the people, while a thorough search was conducted at the crime scene. According to an eyewitness report as released in an editorial by Saturday Punch newspaper of the 6th of February of 1999, the money found in Clifford's residence was estimated to be about 500,000 naira cash, some checks, and two cell phones. Keep in mind, however, that mobile system was introduced into the Nigerian market on the 6th of August of 2001 during the transitional government of President Olusegun Obasanjo. However, official police reports debunked most of the eyewitness reports, claiming that only 60,000 naira was recovered from the crime scene, and there were neither cell phones nor checks. The ramification of the eyewitness report could be disastrous if proven true, and a sad repeat of Owere Otokoto riot of 1966 would want to be avoided at all costs, as the price to pay would be too much to bear. The Daily Times newspaper in an editorial released in that same month stated that the Lagos State Police Command had declared wanted the publishers of some posters of Clifford Orgy naming him a man-eater and embellishing him in misleading acts such as being in possession of a cell phone as at the time of his arrest. The police claimed it was false and vowed to apprehend the publishers of the alleged fake news. Despite the fact that in Saturday Punch, three eyewitnesses had claimed to have seen a large amount of money and cell phones in Clifford's abode. Whatever the truth is, we would never truly know. About 2,000 meters away from Clifford's residence, several clothing, including NYSE uniforms, children's shoes, women's hair, underwears, shirts, neckties, and scarves of various colors were found and farther away were kitchen utensils, pots, firewoods, used tires, along with various chunks of human remains, which included roasted human flesh, bones, and skulls. Clifford's accomplice was reported to have been quiet during the parade, but Clifford spoke quite a bit and incoherently. When asked by the media why he consumed human meat, he replied, and I quote, We use in ourselves human beings, unquote. In another editorial by Yinka Shukombi of Punch newspaper, in a conversation between Clifford Orji and the police officer at the Makinde police station, one of the officers teased him by asking if he was hungry and if he was, he should come and take meat and water. It was said that he quickly got up and approached the window of the cell in which he was detained, demanding for the meat and water he was just offered. So, what was truly the motives for his crimes? An obsessive love for human consumption, or greed, or maybe both? That brings us to another question. 
was Clifford insane or mentally unstable? A group of people strongly believe that he was. His utter lack of remorse for killing and feeding on humans, as well as his incoherent speech, can be said to have been an obvious clue. But no medical certifications were made in this regard. His mental state was the reason he was kept for so long in prison while awaiting trial, as it was said that no hospital wanted to admit him despite the courts requesting a psychological evaluation to determine if he was mentally fit to undergo trial. Clifford was remanded in Kirikiri Prison, Nigeria's only maximum security prison where he was to await trial. But the trial never happened. And after spending 13 years, Clifford died at the age of 46 due to unknown reason. An autopsy was to be carried out, but it isn't a clearly stated cause of death. He was said to have had full-blown psychosis at the time of his demise. Clifford's story has many holes that leaves one to ponder. Leave your thoughts and observation below in our comment section about the thoughts of a strange criminal. During his stay in prison, not one family member were reported to have visited and even in his death, no one came forward to claim his body. Clifford's body was handed over to the government and was probably buried in an unmarked grave. So who exactly was Clifford Emmanuel Orji and what was his relevance to Nigerian crime history? Clifford was a man who may or may not have been mad that killed and fed on humans and also dealt in the sales of human parts. That much we know is true. The court, as we all know, could have mandated any psychiatric hospital to give adequate treatment, but for reasons unknown to us, we would never know why this wasn't done. Perhaps, if he was treated and was coherent enough to give well-articulated speech, he could have aided in bringing down a crime that had persisted for so long. Authorities were not able to trace any of his clients and a trial we could have led to cracking down on a network of human parts traffickers and widespread ritual killings was lost along with the death of Clifford Orji. Clifford was just another tiny piece of a larger puzzle and his death was of no long-term use. His clients would simply look for another supplier and the trade would go on. Sadly, apart from his last victim, Awau, the names of his other victims are unknown as well as the numbers. May your souls rest in peace. Thanks for watching. For more contents like this, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Remember, stay safe and stay blessed. Thank you.